very uh, basic things, first of all, is to have that office open in the district very quickly. Um, other districts have their office already there. That district needs to be there. There needs to be clear engagement and um, accessibility with the community. Um, two, I am going to immediately fight for TIF designation in the district. So what's TIF? TIF is a uh, tax incentive um, for businesses, for development, um, and because we need to make it attractive. As I said, with my experience, I know exactly why businesses come or don't come to an area. They know the data. They don't drive by and see litter or orange and green on Buckner, as one of my opponents keeps saying, and that's why they don't come. That has nothing to do with it. Businesses pull the data. They absolutely know the profile of the demographics in that area. and they make a decisions on that average income level. So it's population and average income level. And as that community changed, as we had white flight, well, that e economics went with them. And so as that fell, that's why so many of those businesses left, because the population did not have the income level and was not giving the patronage to those um, locations to maintain them. And so that's why right now so many in this district have to drive to Mesquite or Duncanville DeSoto to um, buy, or to Balt Springs to buy uh, goods and services. You and mean so they drive can, all the way to Duncanville DeSoto? Sure, absolutely. If you want to go to, uh, you That's know. That's like a, 20, 25 miles away. If you want to go to a Sprouts or you want to go gotcha. to um, a sit-down restaurant that, that is nice, then yeah, they're, in, they're gonna go there, especially if they have you know family or friends in the Oak Cliff area, they're like, okay, we'll, we'll meet you over there. So um, we're giving away a lot of our money to these other cities. And so we need to, so that's my agenda would be to, one, attract major employers. I want to bring in jobs that are living wage, 30000 a year or more, and attract those um, major employers. And if we can, if we attract those major employers and we bring those jobs that are a high, higher paying jobs, and those people see, okay, well, you know what, I can live close to where I work because the cost of living here is so low, the property values are low right now, and so make it attractive for them to come, especially as we build, we have to build mixed use properties and mixed income properties. And that was the findings of the report. Um, as I told you, I worked for over two years on this North Texas Regional Housing Assessment Project. And that project came about because of a lawsuit actually. And so there was a 2015, there's a 2015 order to affirmatively further affordable housing and to desegregate the region because this is a highly segregated region. And so I participated in that project, and the findings now, um, not just City of Dallas, but all of the municipalities that participated in that, they um, have a strong incentive, or between strong incentive and requirement, to begin to implement these recommendations from this project. And so um, that's why getting TIF designation and being able to use the different funding sources to make an attractive package, but also making having those contracts um, so that they do include um, the, equi the equity in terms of providing quality of life, and it's not just giving everything away to the developers. It needs to be in a balanced, responsible stewardship of, uh, of public funds. Now, we're speaking about balance and the economics, and you mentioned about uh, economic flight, income flight, if you will. What and you you gave a, a reasoning of how they could come back mixed use development. We seem to be in this southern sector, so to speak. I hate, hate using that word, but there it is again. Southern sector. We seem to have different kind of problems and issues that they have anywhere else. Down here in the southern sector, that there's the issue of gentrification. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem that, that you see in your, your area? Well, I mean, gentrification happens everywhere, and, and it's just, you, you would just have to go out more historically to see that, okay? Because North Dallas was not uh, a predominantly white neighborhood, uh, you know, before. So th th we've had shifts right in the racial profile in the city and as that shift occurred then the economic decline happened okay so um and we could probably bring donald payton in here and he would give us much much history and understanding those sh those shifts but um gentrification absolutely you know north dallas that is absolutely you know happened but they have then they have a much nicer quality of life there so gentrification is a real concern and we do we do need to put in some um 
some protections. I'm very much concerned, especially for um, our elderly and disabled population who are on fixed incomes, to make sure that um, as we bring in these developments and we are improving the quality of life in the area, something that they have been, you know, praying for for many, you know, decades, and now it actually comes and they can no longer afford to live there. That would be a real, that's a real problem. And so we do need to do some things to protect them. And so um, the uh, the city recently they put in the um, what do you call it the uh, the exemption for uh, senior citizens and elderly, um, which I think that cap is uh, that cap is at one hundred and twelve thousand. So um, they right now anyone who is elderly or a se or disabled and qualifies for that exemption, their their calculation for taxes does not start until their property value exceeds 112,000. Okay, so right now they're fine, but that that all, the city also very wisely said we're going to come back and look at that every two years if we need to make an adjustment. So that is one thing that is already in place to kind of protect, um, you know, to to some degree from um, those who live their whole their whole life then being priced out and not being able to, to stay in their homes. But see, that's the concern that some people have. They say that hey, look. I've lived in this home for a long period of time. Someone else wants the property, not necessarily the home. So mm -hmm. therefore, someone's going to come along and, and, and tax me out, and then I'm going to have to move out. Well, um, I want to make sure that those decisions are based on, hey, if you want to sell and you want to take that profit and you want to move to, to somewhere where else, that's absolutely your choice. It's your property. So we want to respect that. But if you don't want to leave and you want to stay in the place that you've raised your kids and I don't know, sometimes people are like, they want something smaller and easier to manage, and if that's what they want, then great. That's an opportunity for them. But if they don't, we want to make sure that we're protecting them um, so that that is the case. And, uh, you know, let's protect them. Maybe later on when they're leaving an inheritance to somebody, those things would be different. So, okay, now these taxes are due. Now when, if you sell, or if you sell the property, that's when, you know, we're going to, you know, that protection uh, is removed. So, but we absolutely do. I, I know that as people get older, change is really, really hard for them. And they don't want to move. They don't want change often. You Often that is the case. And so we need to be protective of them. I have aging parents. Um, my dad is in his 80s. My mom is in her late 60s. I have a sister who's never walked. And so um, I, I understand what it is for people to live on fixed income. I understand um, you know, the challenge that so many in this community have where our sidewalks are streets, that that infrastructure is so bad that they, there is no sidewalks or if it is, I understand it's so in bad. some parts of your district there, there is no sidewalks. There is no, there's a lot of parts of the district that have no sidewalks and if they're there, they're so crumpled up you couldn't get through them anyway. So a lot of times people who are in wheelchairs or walkers, they're in the streets or they just don't come out because it's not safe for them. And so that creates isolation, and that's a problem for me. And, and then when we come to transportation issues, um, uh, you know, the elimination of the paratransit program is a problem. Um, Wait a minute. They don't have that anymore? They have, my understanding, uh, last time I checked, I could be wrong, but last time I checked, DART was eliminating that program or outsourcing it or something. And so I've had, um, I've had a conversation with somebody recently where, you know, I told them, hey, the city does have programs that provide transportation. My for mother utilized citizens. that. Yeah. Um, but when they, when they contacted, they said, oh, no, first you have to be declined from the DART process. And, <clears throat> excuse me, everything takes time. And in the meantime, they've had doctor's appointments to get to. So like, okay, well, we need to come up with a better plan, uh, a better way, a better process so that um, people who need this transportation, they're not being isolated. They're getting what they need so they can get to the doctors and and, um, and and get the kind of care and attention that they need. Now, some people assert that we need a citizen police review board with mm -hmm. subpoena powers. What's your opinion on that? Well, I've been pretty vocal about that, and um, I went and I spoke uh, several times on this issue, and, and most recently at the, at the last uh, pre briefing I was there, and I spoke also. And um, we have to recognize that there is a need for transparency and accountability. Um, communities of color are hurting, and there is a, a lot of history there, not just from a local level, but from a national level. And so we have to recognize that we can't keep doing things the same way and expect a different result. And so we do need, you know, that board has been there for 40 years or more, more than that, and um, most people didn't even know about its existence. And I sat through an actual um, hearing. Police officer didn't even show up. And, um, you know, they, they couldn't get the, 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 
the cam the, the videos from the from the police officers body cam. the body cams thank you and um, you know they had to go out and find it themselves and then they got one instead of the three or four that were really available and so um, and, and, and these citizens wait a year or more to get a hearing and then get nothing out of it and for a, the vast majority of it is just hey you know what officers you know let's you know uh, have a greater level of interpersonal skills and you know some basic levels of respect and that's a lot of what that is and so um, I'm not anti-police uh, my uh, two of my uh, my children um, the, the two children that I gave birth to I thank God I have five children and I didn't have to go through pregnancy <laughs> and labor for all five of them that's a beautiful thing well, explain to me you have, you have two children five children right? I have five children so um, my two uh, the, the two daughters that are uh, nearest me um, in my pictures um, are the daughters that I gave birth to and they're they have the same father and he is a police officer um, the other children um, uh, so uh, Calvert and Tanya um, I was friends with their mother Winsome and that was the first person I met when I first moved to Dallas back in the mid 90s when I came with uh, Viacom bought Blockbuster and we moved from uh, they relocated a corporate headquarters from downtown Fort Lauderdale to downtown Dallas and that's when Blockbuster was on every corner and so um, that's when I met Winsome. She came to my door and uh, brought her, her son was about a year old at the time, and, um, and her daughter with her. And I met her there, and um, through the years we stayed friends, and she became sick with cancer. She was a nurse for over 20 years, but when she got sick with cancer, and the doctor put her out from work, she lost her job, and um, she missed FMLA protection by 10 hours. And within a couple weeks, she had become homeless. And she was sleeping in the state park in Maryland with her kids when she called me. And um, I immediately became very concerned because she could not get into a woman's shelter because her son was 10. And the cutoff for boys was seven. And that's still the, the case. I think we only have one homeless shelter here in the city of Dallas that accepts boys that are older than that and so when you have a son that's older than seven you can't get into a woman's shelter that means they go into foster care or um, on all boys and so that's that's still a pretty young age and so um, that's how Calvert came to me and so he was on a plane the next day and um, uh, Tanya was already 18 so she stayed helping her mom um, I never expected her to die but she did and so I held her hand while she took her last breaths, and I promised her that her kids were now mine, and I've kept that commitment. And they are absolutely mine. And um, this is my nephew, Jermaine. He's a blood relative. Um, he is my youngest son, my youngest brother's oldest son. Um, and his mother also died from illness, and so I've been very involved with his life. So that's how I have, that's how I have five. <laughs> I've had my hands full with them, but they're all in very different places, yeah. You know, in campaigns, we oftentimes look at just the issues when we are selecting or electing our, well, our leaders. But a lot of times we don't get to the heart of what really makes them run and what makes them tick. And you explain quite a bit on that. It's your compassion. Yeah, I'm, you know, I am running because I care about making things better for my children and my grandchildren that are to come. And you know, I, I do tell them I, I need you to make me, you know, a mother-in-law before you make me a grandmother. Um, and not just, you know, make it, do it the right way. But, you know, my children um, have faced different issues. You know, I'm, I'm mixed, my mother is white, my father's Puerto Rican. Um, so I'm like the, the coffee with milk, like espresso <laughs> with lots of milk and sugar. Um, but my kids are also multiracial. And so they've had, they've had challenges um, even in the church, you know, um, in being multiracial. And so this bridging the, bridging the issues um, racially, socioeconomically, these are things that are really important to me and that's why I've been so involved um, in those in those things because we need to make things better um, for our kids and our grandkids for all of them um, we are 10 years out from um, MLK's 100 year birthday wow. and think you know we are we're still not living by that model to judge people by uh, the content of the character and not the color of their skin and you know what 10 years we got 10 years what can be accomplished in 10 years because Dallas 
is backwards. That Dallas is many years behind in terms of Dallas should be leading the way on resolving this the, the racial divide. It is we are the the belt buckle of the Bible Belt, and we are not there at all. We should be leading this country on dealing with these racial issues between people of color and the police, uh, the socioeconomic divide, all of these things. The, the, we should be leading the way on that. So if elected, how would you help us, uh, you know, help lead us? How would you do it? So, um, you know, it, it, it first of all starts with having um, healthy conversation and having, you know, uncomfortable conversation and uh, practically, for example, let's let's talk about the distribution of, of funding in the city. Correct. Okay, we are we this distributing equally to all the districts in terms of you know bond money or um, you know uh, certain districts. You know the quality the quality of life is not equal across the city. Well, part of that is the reason is that we're going with equality. But it needs to be equity. Right. Which are very two very different things. You no, know, if I give you fifty dollars and I give my friend over here fifty dollars and I say it's all equal, but the equity part and we we would have an equity imbalance if I was giving him fifty dollars for the past fifty years and never gave you anything. And now all of a sudden I want to give you fifty just this year. And then I'm saying well everything's equal. Right, it, it's not, and so that's exactly the point. When you look at parts of, of this city, they have a very high quality of life. So you want to keep giving them the same amount of money when they're already in a very good place. Right. And you have other parts of the city that are struggling. Listen, if we want to deal with these cycles of poverty, we're going to have to put the money where the poverty is. And everyone will benefit. You know, like I said, we're the Bible Belt, and, and most of the people at that horseshoe, they're probably very... Uh, religiously in in the church houses on Sunday and, and or and or Wednesday nights. But do they vote that way on Wednesday? But but that's the point. That's a, a and that's Wednesday biblical. folks is when we have the election not the election when we have city council meetings. Right. So if you go to church on Sunday and you talk about <laughs> equity and you're talking about being right and you and you're talking about uh, uh, applying biblical applying principles, biblical principles mm -hmm. to governance. Mm -hmm. But then on Wednesday you go ahead and you decide to to uh, maybe possibly cut Paratransit. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a that was a dark decision. Yeah, well, I'm but just yeah, saying right. that's the mm -hmm. same process. I'm just, but but that's still a governmental body, dark. So that's what we have to do. Yeah, and and that goes back to you know saying, hey, we're gonna we're gonna give away hundreds of millions of dollars in HUD and TIF funds for 10 percent of the smallest units to be moderate income, and that has happened historically. Uh, we give tax abatements to corporations when they come here, but we don't want to give a living wage to the for work. those. Right. Work so you know these are these are we have to um, we have to make the connection and understand that everybody we're, the entire city hurts when we have parts of the city that hurt. It's and true. so if we want to bring you know and there's people who who never wanted an Amazon here and it's too much too big infrastructure all those things get solved we need we need to bring business here and but we also need to invest in our own and so I'm very big in entrepreneurship and that was part of um, the community workshops that I did for the district is let me teach people how to start a business and how do you get government contracts because we need we need people in, in construction and, and in en and engineering and electrician you know we, we want that that fast train that's going to connect down Dallas with Houston that's going to take a huge amount of workers so there's opportunities there that currently are on the way and even more if we can bring in the right um, 